Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. I'm your host today, Matthew Johnson, and we're here every other Thursday-ish. Uh, we get here as much as we can. This is where we're talking to Hawaii's farmers, foodies, restaurants, everyone who's helping to make Hawaii's local food <coughs> industry stronger, better, and that much more tastier. Uh, as always, you can join the conversation by uh, going into at ThinkTechHI uh, through Twitter, and you can also call the hotline by calling the phone number 808-374-2014. Uh, so as always, we have great, uh, fantastic guests, and with us today, uh, we have the two owners from Yield Restaurant, is the hottest new brunch spot in Chinatown. So we have Kale and Chef Patrick here with me today. Thanks so much for coming on the show, guys. Thank you, man. Yeah, so uh, I've been down, I was just at the restaurant, uh, kind of like a hurricane weekend. It was fantastic, so you guys were open, a good spot to go uh, and get some food, get out of the house. So yeah, thanks so much for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of people like that. that yeah. Way, yeah, I mean, yeah, I was you guys fever. are pretty busy. Cabin people were finding oh, you. Oh my God, dude, the two days that we were closed, I was losing it at my ah. house. So I was yeah. trying to clean anything and everything I could. I was cleaning the AC yeah. and the louvers. <laughs> and, and everyone was tired of cooking for themselves. Yeah. For sure. So it was yeah. perfect, you guys were there. So yeah, why don't we jump right into it? Just tell us, uh, tell us about Yield Restaurant. What, what's it all about? Well, we are a farm-to-table brunch spot right now, and we're focusing on 90% of our local ingredients being local. You know, we need that little 10% of play because uh, we can't get everything that we need year-round. Mm -hmm. So um, right now, we are sourcing from with farm aggregate companies like Wall and Fresh, mm -hmm. and working with about like 60 different local farms. Wow. And we um, like to keep our menu seasonal, changing it like, you know, every month or so, and our fall menu is coming up soon. Yeah. Right on, awesome, yeah, it's cool because I feel like a lot of restaurants, you know, kind of patronize, like, oh yeah, we're farm to table, and then, you know, for, for people like us, you kind of look at the menu, you can kind of tell like how legit it is, but I mean, you guys are super legit with your menu and really mm -hmm. making it, the focus, so it's it's just you know exciting, especially for you yeah. know, someone like myself to really see that because I know it's not easy. Yeah. And that was one of the the things that we wanted to accomplish was um, I mean we had a, a juice company, we worked on a juice company together before, and we tried to do as much local as possible, but it was limited to fruits yeah. and leafy greens, and mm -hmm. we couldn't use like meats or eggs or you couldn't have that sirloin steak potatoes, juice. Potatoes, you know what I mean, and. <laughs> And uh, when we decided to do a restaurant, we wanted to do farm to table, but very genuinely and as best as we could, at least. Yeah. Um, and and calling something yield, I think, adds some weight to that and leaves less room to be, you know, like fake about it. And yeah. so that was like definitely one of our missions was to try to do it as best as we could genuinely. Yeah. yeah. Right on. Well, yeah. So where? Uh, let's talk about some details. Where is the restaurant, and, and how do you know how do people find it? Um, it's at the corner of Hotel and New Wanu. Okay. Right next to Fet. Yeah. And uh, you can find us on Instagram at Yield Restaurant, and um, on our Yelp page also if you want to check out our menu and what our food looks like. Um, our specialties are right now Dutch Baby. Everyone says we have the best steak and eggs Ooh. in town. Um, make a really good bruschetta, we bake all our bread in house, and we have uh, two, like, one to three juices every day from uh, what we can get locally. Okay. All right, so how, so, okay, so you mentioned before that you guys were doing a juice company before, what was that all about? <clears throat> so it's called Nalo Juice. Okay. Um, and I, I studied botany and tropical plants and soil sciences. I didn't graduate though. Which what? Is, that, that's a big thing, because there's been a few articles that say that I have a degree Clearly. in that, oh. but I do not have a degree in that. I, I mean, we've out of heard college. of some local politicians that come <laughs> back to bite them in the butt, so. I do not uh, have a degree. In, okay, in I'm either. glad that you put that but degree in there. I did study it, yeah. <laughs> and um, so my first year at UH, uh, I decided to travel and work on some farms um, in the mainland in, in Thailand and then in Hilo. And that started the juicing thing, was seeing how much produce goes into one <laughs> bottle of juice. and. Uh, that you don't really need like the, the stuff that would be on the shelf. You could you don't want rotting produce, but you could do like off grade like yeah. different 
shaped produce is, you know, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and then we did that in the farmer's markets for like two and a half years. Okay. And then we got approached with this opportunity at Hawaii Office Centers, mm -hmm. um, which is currently our space now. Mm -hmm. And it was a little too big to just do a juice bar. And we wanted, we never wanted juice to limit like what we did. Mm -hmm. We wanted to be able to expand and we- A lot uh, of other ideas. Yeah, I mean, we, we learned a lot from it. Uh, we've made a lot of relations. That's how I met you, I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure, through yeah. Lauren and the farmer's markets. And um, then it just kind of made sense. Like, hey, you know, Patrick's chef career started really taking off. And like I said, the space was just too big to just do a juice bar and we've wanted to expand their wings. And then it rolled into what's the juiciest Time of the day is brunch, really, yeah, and yeah. Um, there was no brunch in Chinatown mm. at the time after Scratch moved to Ward. Uh -huh. So it kind of just all happened pretty organically, and yeah. now we're where we're at now. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So, so you guys are pretty much starting the restaurant off as a brunch spot. Yes. Yes. And then, and, and oh, it's interesting too. So this is. Um, you, the space is actually kind of <coughs> just on the Naka side of, of Fet Restaurant, and it's it's part of the the Hawaii Office Center. Hawaii Office yes. Center. Yeah. So it's like a co-working space ish yeah. type. So place. upstairs is shared co-working offices. Okay. Which is cool because downstairs, I mean, there's a lot of like not collaboration yet, but there's a lot of communication and mm -hmm. um, people trying to help each other out with the restaurants, and it's it's just like all. One thing from upstairs to yeah, downstairs. Yeah, it's yeah. a cool little community, you know. Yeah, it is a neat spot. It seems like you said, like a lot of good potential, especially you know, kind of tapping in. I mean, it's great. You have uh, Chuck and Robin right there with yeah. that, just kind of holding down the corner. Yeah. Uh, then Danny you have guys the at, at Encore, and yeah. then you have Brickfire Tavern and yeah. Hachi Bay. Oh yeah. And everyone does their own thing, you know. It's it's yeah. it's not like you're not really stepping on anybody's yeah, toes. Yeah. yeah. And it's cool too, because like uh, I mean, it's we we're kind of joking earlier that you know, to find you guys, it's you really kind of have to know where you're going because you know it's not a big space. Mm -hmm. I think we even have a, a picture on the inside where it's about uh, 500 square feet. The 400. Total 400. Yeah. So it's uh, 20 seats on the inside. Oh, there, okay, there we go. There's a picture. And there, yeah, yeah, I love how you're wearing the same shirt, same hat. <laughs> <laughs> but that, I mean, that was kind of. I mean, it's it's manageable for us. It's our first yeah. restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, we can kind of run it lean with the staff until we figure out, I mean, till now that we've been open, but in the beginning it was kind of nervous, like taking on staff and yeah. being accountable for people where we can pivot easier, it's more manageable, we can focus on the food, mm -hmm. uh, the sourcing, like what exactly we're trying to do. Yeah, and a little service. bit more. Yeah. 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 Instead cool. of like having a staff something, you know, like 50 employees right yeah. off the get go. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's super it's super smart, you know, kind of control your costs and really, like you said, focus on the, the quality of the food, quality of the service. But I was thinking, because like we were saying before, where you guys have it set up <coughs> as brunch right now, just kind of get it up and going, that kind of gives you time where there's availability at nighttime for, like, private parties. Like, I think we already have a think tech uh, party planned. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're going to bring all the think tech crew over there for one night. And it's cool because you can do that because, I mean, how many total seats are, are in the space? Um, like 24. Okay. There. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's easy to find 23 other friends and yeah. kind of Yeah, and, and the brunch thing, it's, it's, for us, it's nice to get off of work by four-ish, yeah. you know, and uh, So you're available right to now, come on to shows like it's, this? It's more sustainable in the beginning, you know, yeah. rather than being down there till midnight or 2 a.m. and dealing with that whole crowd and... Yeah. Um, I think once we do, what we always talk about, once we do open up for dinner, we'll already have some sort of following, and yeah. uh, that's where we can kind of do different stuff than what we're doing now, and yeah. it leaves us time, basically, to to grow. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it gives you a life outside of work so that yeah. you can appreciate it and enjoy it versus, you know, I'm sure some other restaurant operations, it's just like 24-7, it's, yeah. it's all you can really think about and do, and exactly. it just kind of drags you down. Yeah. But it's nice because you guys also have kind of like that uh, courtyard space that I think you guys are working on as, as kind of like, a, I guess, a common area with some of the other restaurants mm -hmm. that are there that you can take, yeah. take advantage of. Because mm -hmm. you said you were like building out some tables. So, I mean, or, we just haven't moved out there yet. For one, it's been super hot. Yeah. I mean, it's summer, so... And we're open in the middle of the day mm -hmm. where it's it's cooking out there. So, it, I mean, it, it is a priority for us. Uh, we just opened, so it's nice to have everyone in front of us. Um, we just finished building 
our tables for the outside, so we're talking with the building of how the layout goes exactly. But it'll be about an extra 18 to 20 seats Oh wow! Out there, so it's about going to double the yeah. amount of yeah. space that you guys have. That's great. Yeah, it's nice being able to kind of have that when you're ready. Yeah, uh, to really kind of double down on what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you just have to make sure everyone gets their food that tastes good and, you know, comes out right. And mm -hmm. you have to train kitchen staff and just to get everything going for sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, fun. Stuff <laughs> I, I mean, it's stagger seating and ordering. We can't just sit. Like, right now, we can sit the whole restaurant one time and we'll be getting pounded. But yeah. for the most part, it's manageable. But once we have that extra seating, yeah, then comes in, nice. like, the fine-tuning of that. Like, yeah, not yeah. taking on too much at one time. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And now we're getting to a point where we uh, we need extra space, you know, to accommodate people we've had to wait, and it doesn't feel good to like have to turn people away. Right. You know, you don't want to be like it's too, ex super exclusive or anything you're, like that. You're the, the popular, you know, <laughs> kid at school. Everybody wants to come and hang out with. Just make a reservation. <laughs> <laughs> nice plug. Yeah, 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 definitely. So Patrick, talk a little bit about your background. So you had, so did you go to like uh, culinary school or where, where, where did you come from? Um, I just battled in the kitchen, you know. So yeah. I used to work at a bunch, uh, two fine dining Japanese restaurants, uh, Restaurant Wada and Teppanyaki Ginza Onodera. Okay. And um, Teppanyaki Ginza Onodera is like, you know, a fine dining Japanese restaurant. 13 seats, and uh, wow. they are one of three restaurants in America that's certified to sell A5 grade Kobe beef. Oh, wow. So, which is the highest type of Wagyu you can probably get. Yeah. And um, from there, I got to learn from some really good chefs. Uh, um, the chef that was the head chef there when I first started, he got made sous chef at Robushan in Tokyo, oh, wow. in Roppongi, when he was like 33. Mm. So that's pretty, that's pretty like badass for sure. Yeah. And then um, the other guy was, the other chef was the uh, chef owner of Mimasia in the Raku Tower before, and then he was a really good Italian chef. So I got to learn from them, I got to learn from uh, Takanori Wadasan, and then um, yeah, I just kind of got my chops from them you know like i had to teach myself japanese wow. and i had to uh you know communicate with them in all japanese and then i kind of got to like learn like my aesthetic of cooking and also like you know like if i cook something how do people know it's my dish mm. which is like you know like kind of what i got from all these different japanese chefs because when they cook something even though it's the same recipe the same ingredients you can tell who's dish it is or who made it basically huh. yeah talk a little bit more about that that's interesting so um <laughs> just kind of like your own personal you know because now you've moved mm -hmm. into your own space and you're kind of creating you know like how like explain more about that for people who aren't necessarily you know because like when i cook i'm just kind of going off a recipe and i yeah. don't necessarily have like my form like what is that what does that mean so that like, like i mean basically when you're when you're cooking at like a high level like that you have to kind of like show like like what your soul looks like on a plate mm. you know if you like get really into it you have to think about like like okay like something really f fine and specific like should i like f fine grind the spices should i make it coarse and then that changes like the texture everything about the dish so you're basically like a artist slash product designer we have to think about like how is the diner going to interact with the plate mm. which is like so, which is like half of it and then you also also think about like you know like your style of cooking you know so like it's like uh how my grandma would make something and my dad would make something and it's the same exact recipe but of course my grandma's gonna make it better because you know she has adds her own aesthetic she has her own secrets that aren't on the recipe card mm -hmm. you know so it's just all about experimentation and figuring out what works for you yeah. basically yeah, yeah. Awesome, right on, guys. All right, well, we're going to take a quick uh, one-minute break, and we'll be right back to it. Cool. Okay. Cool. Aloha. I am Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green for Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at 3, and I have really, really exciting guests on the exciting topic of energy efficiency. Hope to see you there. I'm Jay Fidel, ThinkTech. ThinkTech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. 
Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. And welcome back to White Food and Farmers Series. I'm your host today, Matthew Johnson. And I almost forgot to mention, uh, today is our 100th episode. So congratulations to ThinkTech and all the great guests that we've had on the show and all the other uh, hosts as well, Stephanie Pomai and Justine. Um, so we're very excited for this uh, milestone. So thanks, guys, for uh, joining us for uh, number 100. Oh, that's amazing. Um, so yeah, so we have Chef Patrick and Kale with Yield Restaurant. Um, just talking about the hottest new brunch spot in Chinatown. And uh, we're just kind of talking to Chef Patrick here about just really what it means to kind of, you know, because we all talk about, you know, cooking at home, but then really, you know, how do you create that that experience and kind of taking your cooking and, you know, being a true chef and, and how that works. And we were talking briefly during the break about, you know, you guys are really focusing on, you know, hence the name of the restaurant, <coughs> Yield Restaurant. You're working with whatever the local farms are yielding and what's available. You know, it's not an easy concept. I mean, said at the beginning of the show, a lot of restaurants want to do that and talk about that and kind of patronize that but you guys are are doing it so let's talk a little more about that what you know what so you guys have been open for now for two and a half months mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and before that you guys were doing uh, a local juice company so you're very familiar with you know local farms and the products that are available you know, what's what's been working really well and also what's what's been i guess challenging for you know sourcing for these dishes that you're trying to do. Well, I mean, if something's not available, we have to change it up, you know? So, yeah. I mean, it's just that like flexibility with our concept and, you know, the talents of our kitchen. That and also having a customer base that understands yes. that for the most part, like no one's really complained yeah. about, which is super cool, I think. And, and I think that the way that we've positioned ourselves allows that, mm -hmm. where if something's out, it's, I mean, yeah. it's we're trying our best to make sure that that doesn't happen, but. Yeah. We can only do so much, you know. I mean, we always have to ask ourselves, like, what is yield? Is this is this yield or yieldy? You know, like we have to think about, like, <clears throat> okay, like this dish sounds good, but how can we make it local? How can we make it our own? How can you know we like show who we are as like a restaurant and how we want to help our local agricultural community, mm -hmm. which is like really important to us because when we're in high school, maybe. 95% of our food was imported, mm. and now we're at 85% 10 years later. So yeah. hopefully we can keep bumping that number down. Yeah. yeah. But we would like to see more duck eggs. Duck eggs, yes. Duck That's egg. a big thing. Tell me about we, the duck we eggs. need duck eggs. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll keep working on that. And yeah, like yeah, like this week, like the kale didn't show up. Yeah. So I'm sure that kind of messed you guys up, where you know, you're kind of banking on kale for some some of the dishes. Mm -hmm. How about um, when we like deconstruct some of the dishes that you have, and just kind of so you can kind of explain like, what are the items that are going into it? Okay. Um, like the bruschetta. I mean, obviously the the grains and stuff for the bruschetta probably isn't local. Uh, but why don't you talk about that dish? Um, so we make an in-house sourdough that uh, has a starter that's about 30 years old and pass on from baker to baker, yeah. and then we um, we proof that for about three days. And then sometimes we put uh, naked dairy buttermilk mm. whey inside. So we make cheese from the naked dairy buttermilk, and then we put the whey inside just to boost the sourness. And then after that, we get whole farm tomatoes, some uh, some sweet ever onions, mm. and then uh, caramelized onions, um, garlic, olive oil, and then uh, put a little bit of white wine, flambe it a little bit, then add the whole farm's tomato medley. And then we finish out with balsamic vinegar, reduce it, caramelize it, put it on some Parmesan cheese and some cilantro. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, as far as uh, what we can get locally, we're really stoked on having a local dairy. That's huge, you know, because, I mean, you know, for the last 20 years, we haven't had a local dairy. Yeah. And it's good to kind of see that, like, grassroots movement happen, like how it's happening all over America right now, where people are going back to these, you know, small farms and the FDA is being a little bit more lenient on like mm. raw milk products, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. So why don't you yeah, talk a little more about what kind of products, you know, so you mentioned duck eggs, 
as an uh, item that you hope to see. Uh, what are some other items that you're just really like, ah, oh, you want to get, get your hands on? Finger limes. Finger limes, okay. Finger limes, yeah. uh, you know, like really cool exotic That okra fruits. medley was pretty cool. The okra medley we seen um, from, I think it was V Farms, was pretty cool. It was, there was like purple okra, red oh, okra, okay. all different sizes. Um, yeah. And, and and we just asked like if there's anything that they would like farmers would want to grow like yeah, I yeah. mean if, if we can help in any way by testing it or yeah. like we don't I don't know how much what different kinds of produce are out there that they like you know like this farmer might have something that has been special to him that he wants to grow that he hasn't been able to grow and just pushing that limit to be comfortable with doing stuff like that I think yeah, yeah. is the message you know and also finding like farmers who have surplus and excess mm -hmm. and you know like they're gonna throw it away and then the part of the yield concept which is part of the knowledge use concept is that we're gonna take what you got and at least give you some money for it rather than it all going to waste yeah you know and then that helps the farmers you know like like at least make their waste into a little bit of cash and then you know from there we can all like support build each other build on each other yeah 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 I think there's been a lot of talks around like ugly produce. Like it's definitely kind of like almost like a hot topic within like you know, local ag. And mm -hmm. but I th what I've seen is just like the realities of, of making it happen can be can be challenging. And uh, it's great that you guys are you kind of putting yourselves out there as like, hey, yeah, we're we're flexible, we're open. And I think you have to like kind of create that dialogue, get that dialogue started, and just saying, hey, if you have this available. You know we can you know we can take it yeah mm -hmm. I, I think um, and and to build on that is like to see how much produce actually gets wasted that a farm produces you know I worked on this tomato farm and maybe out of the, out of the hundred percent of tomatoes that this plant grew mm -hmm. maybe fifty percent was actually harvested <coughs> either got attacked by bugs or fell on the ground yeah and out of that fifty percent harvested, maybe 50% went to market, you know? So you're talking about like 25% of the tomatoes that this plant grew actually got to the market and then who knows how much waste is there, but we would get dump trucks filled with tomatoes that you couldn't use, you know? Like that's wow. crazy. Like to, then what, what was happening with uh, the tomatoes that you couldn't use? I, I think they were just being dumped or composted. Dumped composted. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but I mean, that's crazy to see that much. I mean, and, and there's this guy, Joel Salatin, yeah. who's like a really famous oh, yeah, uh, yeah. cattle rancher and stuff. Out of uh, Virginia, right? Yeah, and he talks about how we don't have a food hunger pro or a world hunger mm -hmm. issue, we have a world waste issue so yeah. it's like trying to build on that as much as we can from our small little neighborhood restaurant but I mean that's like the ideas that we think about every day yeah I've had some conversations and, and spoken to different groups that are trying to focus on the food waste part of it and it is really challenging like um, and there's not a, there's a, there's not a lot of benefits for the farmer too I mean like the more that he sells his waste that it devalues his good tomatoes that come right. are on the shelf you know like yeah. Like if, so, if someone's gonna wait four days to get a cheaper product, yeah. they, they will do that. You right, know right, what I mean? Right, so right. you're not you're like devaluing your premium. Like, I don't I don't know what the solution is, but that that was like a huge eye opening thing for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think even the challenge too is like the county doesn't even have an actual like composting system, mm -hmm. so there isn't like a, a county wide you know program for it, and even to. Uh, and I'm not sure what you guys are doing with, with any food waste that you have, but I think it's like technically illegal just to give it to a farm. And it's got to be like a certified process on yeah, yeah. how that food uh, is being properly handled. Yeah, so there's a lot of bacteria uh, yeah. and stuff yeah. involved. Yeah, because right? I mean, it's still you're still dealing with you know yeah. rotting food that is going back into the food yeah. system, so it could still get people sick. Yeah, this one lady that uh, does fets compost said mm. it has to be all pre prep no meats, no dairy, just all vegetables pre prep So it's just you know all your cores and all that kind of you know skins and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 Cool. Well, hey, let's um, um, kind of talk about like your guys. You know, I know you guys are super young guys, super ambitious, and you have lots of ideas. So what, you know, usually what we like to do with the guests that we bring on is kind of like talking about like the future of the things that you want to do, but also just kind of like overall. Like here we are talking about a, a better composting system uh, for Hawaii. What, you know, what, what are some of the, like 
I guess the bigger concepts of what you guys want to see for your Hawaii, your your local mm. local ag, local restaurant scene. I mean, we would like to see definitely more farms on board with slaughterhouse or a butcher. Or uh, a, yeah. What were we talking about? FDA certified yeah. slaughterhouse. So, um, like right now, if people are you know growing any type of like meat, mm -hmm. producing any type of meat, they have to go to FDA slaughterhouse. And so we send a lot of our cattle to the mainland. Yeah. And then, um, like right now on the Big Island, what they're doing is they have a they have a you know big sixteen wheeler truck that has a slaughterhouse FDA approved built into it. Yeah, the you know, so, slaughterhouse. Yeah, so that's kind of what we want to see is is um, you know keeping more of the meat on island. And also, like, um, you know, seeing, like, better local meat also, which mm -hmm. means that they just have to have more business so they can make a superior product. Yeah. yeah. Have you guys checked out Butcher and Bird yet? No, I've been wanting to go. Yeah, though. I've heard good things about it's it. It's in Kakako. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll take you guys. Yeah? Yeah, uh, this guy, Chuck, he, he's been on the show before. And so what he's doing is kind of like an in-house butcher mm -hmm. you know, shop. And he's doing a lot of work with, like, quinoa and some other uh, meat products and yeah, it's you guys will love it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, just to have access to like to be able to do charcuterie and stuff like that, but do it locally would be yeah. cool. Yeah, it's kind of like we're talking to uh, Bob with Pono Pork, yeah, mm -hmm. and just kind of some of the challenges where he's got all those amazing ideas and these products, but I, we've all kind of seen firsthand just the challenges of just being FDA, able to do it. Yeah. It's got to be this proper facility yeah. where you I mean, have a, a lot USDA of overhead guy too, right? on staff. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really challenging when yeah. you start going into it and you really have to have it planned out and yeah. figuring out the costs and everything to go with it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah you, can't def you definitely can't wing situations like that at yeah. all. Yeah. And then so with uh, the restaurant, um, so we only have about a minute left. Um, so you guys are planning on... Uh, opening up for dinner at some point soon. I think you mentioned that middle end of November. Okay, around there. We're yeah. just working on the uh, with the building about more cold storage. If we want to do like mm -hmm. a, another service yeah. for that day, a different menu, we would need more more cold storage. Our liquor license kicks in soon. Oh, nice. Um, either this week or next week, and then we'll be moving outside. Like we said, very cool. soon. Eight par Bloody Mary menu, cold pressed juice mimosas. Yeah. Oh, so, there we go. Champagne cocktails. Champagne cocktails. You know, yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna best we, brunch ever. <laughs> yeah, you know we we haven't we just started and you know we're seeing like we're seeing definitely like what we can do with yeah. what we have so far in our local agricultural community. Awesome. Yeah. Right on, guys. Well, thank you so much. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have. Really appreciate you guys coming on the show and just hearing more about everything you're doing. So stoked to just keep going back there and I look forward to the Bloody Marys. Right on. Awesome. Uh, thank you for joining us, Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. And we are here every other Thursday. Aloha.